Good evening. Thanks for coming. It's nice, nice to see such a good crowd. Uh, I'm Michael Brown, president of SAR, and it's my great pleasure to introduce this year's Land Indigenous Writer in Residence, Max Early. Before I do, I'd like to thank the Land Foundation for the generosity which makes all this possible. The speaker tonight, Max Early, is uh, from Laguna Pueblo. He's a graduate of UNM, where he studied English and creative writing. He started writing poetry eight or nine years ago. Uh, that work culminated uh, in his first book, Ears of Corn and Listen, which was published by the Three Press and Taos, uh, many copies of which seem to be being sold tonight, which speaks well of Max and his fan base. Um, and I'm sure another one is coming soon. Joey Harjo, in writing about his first book of poetry, said, each poem is a pottery of words, complete with designs to bring rain, to remember and praise the earth and sky path we humans travel. She references Max's other gift, Max's other gift, which is ceramics, and you'll hear more about that tonight, and he may have something to say about that. I didn't, I, was, I knew that he was a potter, but I wasn't aware of the amazing gift that he had until I looked at some pictures today online and said, wow, this guy's really a, like a double threat. And he's a great poet and he's a great potter. So uh, Max uh, is going to do a reading and then he's going to be open, uh, open the floor to questions and I'm sure he'll have some. And then, uh, so please join me in welcoming Max Griffin. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. First of all, I'd like to uh, thank the School of Advanced Research for hosting the event and also uh, for the Landon Foundation for their generous grant. And I'd like to talk in my native language first. Uh, uh, I said in my native Karis language, good evening to everybody, and I'm from the Turkey People Clan and a child of the Bear Clan, and I wanted to thank everybody for being here tonight, and I'll go ahead and uh, start reading. Um, the presentation tonight, I've, I've entitled it, Drops of Words. So this is my first book. I came out last year in May of uh, 2014. It's called Ears of Corn Listen. The publisher is Three at House Press. And my publisher is here tonight, Andrea Watson. And so I'll go ahead and I'll start my first poem. And I always like to start off my first poem. Uh, this is my son, Alan, when he was six months old. And his uh, godparents had uh, dressed him up. And uh, this is how you got your name for Alan. One tree struck by lightning fashioned into a cradle board, protect my little one. Three tall river willows chosen, shaped and bent like an arch, keep my baby safe. Four buckskin loops on each side, zigzag lace belt like lightning, hold my child secure. Six colors of the sun sought, sewn beads around your willows, comfort my son to sleep. Grandfather said, your cradle board was charming, so we named you Kashjatsi, Kashjatsi, Rainbow, my rainbow. This is a picture of my great grandmother on my father's side. Her name was Shikaya, and in the, the name in our language doesn't have a meaning, it's, it's uh, just a person's name. And my great aunt, my, uh, my own uh, grandmother, had two sisters, there was three girls, and the two younger sisters were um, going after, um, they got some potteries from the dancers, and as they were walking back home to their mother's house, they were practicing, and one of the pots uh, fell off one of the sisters' heads and busted, it, and then so they had to go back and tell their mom that you know, the, one of the potteries uh, got broken, and, uh, but when they break, say pacha, to let it rain. So this next poem I read is called Conveying Spring Rains. And there is um, three Karis words. Uh, the Karis language is spoken by seven of the 19 Pueblos here in New Mexico, Santa Ana, Cochiti, Laguna, Acoma, Zia, and Santa Domingo. 
and the words I'll say is that Tsipina is Mount Taylor, Shiwana are the rain clouds, and Shika, my grandmother's name. And this is a pantoon. Conveying spring rains, spring skies parched, clear and white blue, rainmaker smokes with mountain spirits, puffing cumulus clouds over Tsipina. Deserts are rainless without a dance. Rainmaker smoking with mountain clouds. Thunder clouds burst over mesa tops of pinyon. Deserts are rainless without a dance. Raindrops are always perfectly round. Thunder clouds burst over mesa tops of cedar. Summer rain is falling on Mother Earth to herald the Shiwana. So raindrops are always perfectly round, tapping ponds like rapid drum beat circles. Summer rain is falling on Mother Earth to herald the Shiwana on southwestern lands, tapping ponds like rapid drum beat circles. Frogs croak their chants and dance once more. Herald the Shiwana on southwestern lands with water designs of drizzling cloud drops. Frogs croak their chants and dance once more. Sunrise ends their showering leap of music. With water designs of drizzling cloud drops, Women draw water from painted bird oyas. Sunrise ends their showering leap of music. Now they walk bearing jugs above their heads. Women draw water in painted bird oyas. Red woman and blue woman balance as they walk bearing jugs above their heads. Home to their mother, Shikaya's house. Red woman and blue woman balance dawdling along the ditch of running stream. Home to their mother, Shikaya's house. Red woman's swaying pot spots sister's eye. Dawdling along the ditch of running stream, corn leaves glisten bright with drops of dew. Red woman's swaying pot spots sister's eye. Blue woman reaches up, saving sliding olla. Corn leaves glisten bright with drops of dew. In the mud, Shikaya wears no moccasins. Blue woman reaches up, saving sliding olla yet uses her pose and her pottery falls. In the mud, Shika wears no moccasins, and she says, Pacha, let it rain. She loses her pose and her pottery falls like a cloud still clinging to a rainbow. When she says, Pacha, let it rain, Mother Earth becomes filled once again like a cloud still clinging to a rainbow. We look for arrowheads after the storm. Mother Earth becomes filled once again, puffing cumulus clouds over Tsipina. We look for arrowheads after the storm. Spring skies clear and white blue. The next poem I wanted to read is, is called The Clay Lizard. And I wrote this poem for my, my Aunt Florence. She had a friend who was part of the Lizard Clan. and She told me about him. And uh, when he left, she said, always remember me. When you see a lizard, I'll be around to come visit you. So this poem is called The Clay Lizard for Florence. Before Lawrence went, before Lawrence went, he told me he was from the Laguna Lizard Clan. He gets into the house sometimes. I find clay and mold him down, taking him outside to dry. He's crawling on my screen door, looking in at me with his beady eyes. He gets into the house sometimes. He licks up fruit flies under camouflage, crawling back to my damp clay. Fast runner to cover as he detaches his tail, he assumes I'm a predatory potter. I find clay and roll him a new tailpiece. This time I attach him to my pot, taking him outside to dry. Before he sets himself free, he says, look, what you're, look where you're stepping. I'm out here watching over you. Don't ever hurt me, please, and feed us lizards something sweet. This is a picture of my mom. She was 15, and my Aunt Florence, she's 10 years old, and uh, we just lost our Aunt Florence. Uh, we buried her yesterday, 
And this is a picture of my aunt, when she, the, um, the, a little sister, when she was 10 years old. And I um, wrote a poem early on, and so I uh, revised it. And this is one of my new works that I'm uh, working on on my second manuscript. And here's another photograph of a feast scene. And my auntie, my uncle, and my cousin Cheryl, and uh, my grandma Linda, they're uh, eating some sandwiches or something at the feast. So this, this poem that I wrote, it's called, My Enti Baby Took Me to Laguna Feast. Since my car broke down, getting around became a chore. Stuck at home without wheels gives you a perspective on what really matters. I woke up with aspirations of finishing my pottery orders, but the annual feast was underway with the parade at nine. With no way to get down to Laguna, I concentrated on my pottery. Just when I started sifting my clay, the phone rang. It was my mom's sister. All the nieces and nephews called her Auntie Baby. My older brothers, Harry and Jim, couldn't pronounce her name, Florence, and Grandma Linda called her Baby, since she was the youngest of three girls. Auntie Baby said, there were 47 entries and me and Grandpa watched until we got hungry. We found a stand that had mutton sandwiches. Mmm, yeah, uh, Max said, thinking of the fried bread, green chili, lamb combined with lettuce, onions, and tomatoes. We got off the subject and started talking about the New Mexico State Fair and why Auntie Baby couldn't go on account of her sore neck. I woke up the other day with a really bad sore neck. I couldn't even move my head to the side unless I moved my whole body, she said. I told my auntie to get a massage so she could loosen up her neck. Oh, like what the medicine man does, Auntie Baby replied. Yeah, ha, it will make you feel better, Max said. So my mutton neck will feel better, she said. Your what, Max said. We laughed about her neck, looking like a mutton neck, all stiff and dry. Then my aunt said, why don't I call Mr. Reyes? Mr. Lawrence Reyes was my aunt's friend, a kind, soft-spoken man, always helping Auntie with handyman chores. Mr. Reyes is going down to a pizza party at the Family Fun Center. You can catch a ride down with him. He can drop you off at the feast. I'll meet you there so we can go get some mutton sandwiches. Mmm, nyo, throat stretcher. Let's hurry and go. Max said. He should be through with the pizza party around 5.15. Mr. Reyes can meet you on his way back up to Powati, Auntie Baby said. Hina, hanya sho, said Max. Okay, let's go then. Auntie Baby confirmed the arrival and departure times with her boyfriend. Soon we were at Laguna Feast, chomping down on our mutton sandwiches. I finished my sandwich first, and Auntie said, go look around. I'll wait here for you. I ended up buying two Fiesta burgers, roast corn, and some homemade donuts from my friend Grace Coyote. As we were leaving Laguna Feast, Auntie Baby told me to pull over to the side. Pointing to one of the roadside vendors, she said, I want to buy some green chili, just enough to go with my eggs in the morning. She gave me some chili to cook up with my breakfast too. We drove up to Pawati Turnoff at the same time as Mr. Reyes did. Mr. Reyes lived on top of a mesa called Pork Chop Hill. Here comes the Pawati Pork Chop Shuttle, Inti Baby said. I told her, I better go. My taxi's here and the meter's running. We chuckled in amusement. Then I hugged my Inti Baby goodbye. This other new work that I work on, um, there's a lizard that lives here in the southwest and in Laguna, it's called a chashchi. And I didn't know that this lizard was around and I um, found out you know, um, after just knowing that, uh, bumping into each other, you know, that this lizard, it's pretty big, it's uh, like a small alligator there, but they're, they're kind of... <laughs> And this poem has um, 
uh, five carrier words in it. So Chashchi is a New Mexico collared lizard here, and uh, Hati Mitzi is where's the clay. Hati Stranayasha, where's our mother? Stranayasha Mitzi is our mother clay, and Gawake is Laguna Pueblo. This is Chashchi. Never noticed nor saw a Chashchi before, living my life in Laguna Pueblo. Finally, not meeting one, but a whole family. Potter June spoke of good clay near Blue Water Place, so Luli and Papa Max went hunting for her. They set out that early June summer day. Morning's end found them on the edge, a shallow cliff. Unbeknownst, they were being critiqued by the Chashchi. Papa Max said, what a big luminous green lizard, size of a small alligator. The Chashti looked at them. Papa Max spoke, Hati Mitzi, Hati Trinayashe. They looked around and several Chashti listened. Suddenly, all the Chashti turned their head northeastward to reveal their close clay where Stranaya Mitzi lay. Yet Grandma Elsie warned us about the Chashchi. My sister and I were on horseback and those Chashchi were chasing us. Papa Max laughed in disbelief. Grandma Elsie retorted, no bullshit. <laughs> those Chashchi were chasing us and running right behind, beside us until... Back home in Laguna, I told my cousin Gina's boyfriend Frank how Chashti showed me where the, to find clay around their house. Frank said, they love to chase you, like this one time at sheep camp. Chashti. <laughs> <laughs> it's a poem I, I wrote. Um, my mom's the oldest and she has uh, two younger sisters and they're getting up in years and you know, I felt bad about, you know, the poem speaks for itself, so I'll, I'll read it. It's, called Matrilineal Winter. Traditionally at Laguna, the house is given to the oldest daughter. The Akuma, the house is given to the youngest daughter. The house belonged to Grandma Marie, given to her oldest daughter, Jane. Soon Jane gave Sister Clara the family home. Three sisters in their winter share their mother's house. They are Orion's belt, wintry sister stars. Three stars softly fading, reminisce festal shadows, mom's chili stew cooking, seven up in the Frigidaire. Three sisters embrace home, but not like they used to. Keep moving around, more aches flare. What do we do with your house, mom? We feel bad that you're getting old. We'll help you when we can. We miss the old Jew. Serious oldest daughter, humorous middle girl, cheerful youngest baby, wintry sister stars. This is a picture of my grandma's house in the village of uh, Philadelphia, New Mexico. And a lot of people would stop by and say, where's Philadelphia at? And you're, you're looking at it. <laughs> it's like maybe three houses, four houses. It's a, it's a small village. But a lot of the old folks that went to school at Carl Indian School, they named the smallest uh, hamlets in the Pueblo after the big cities. We have a town called New York, and we have a Chinatown, so different places. So in our language, Kowatsi uh, is uh, hello, how are you? So this poem is called Dessert Anytime. Winds breeze in, greeting frequent ghosts, blowing through empty panes. Kowatsi, he said, is anyone there? Whispering vibrations of howls echo about, once solid glass, now shattered reflections. Grandma and grandpa praying to the stove. Old Pueblo home, abandoned stone fortress. Memories of grandma, whitewashing walls. Her caress, 
brought fresh rain sent inside. She had a special spot by the bedroom door. Her grandchildren could not resist. We licked her walls. They tasted so good. This is a drawing of the corn dance that we have in our Pueblos and the songs uh, tell about our migration coming into this area uh, from like Mesa Verde up north and how the people came out from Shabbat from the underground and how we came into this world to where we are to this day. So every year at the, the feasts uh, around the Pueblos, uh, that's the commemoration of the, it's called the Green Corn Dance in the Northern Pueblos and then out in the Western Pueblos, it's, we call them, uh, it's Darawai. Tarawe, and it's the father leader. And um, this poem I wrote, I was, I helped uh, dance in San Domingo, and one year I wasn't dancing and it rained, and I was just uh, observing, you know, all the, uh, the dancers and the rain and the mud. So this poem is called Sounds the Eagles Here. Green corn stalks and swaying tan tassels embrace the shrine walls. Singers and dancers circle inside the plaza, corn stalks crack, release, during the last song. Green corn ears and clinging brown hands, rhythm of bells and shells ring, time with the drum. Calling two eagles, drawing rain clouds near, unison rattles shake like thunder, absorb rejoicing of dancers. Raindrops cling to fallen evergreen branches. Mud oozes through slippery toes. Rattles shake like thunder. Green corn ears and exchanging hands pass the blessing door to door. Enduring corn mother. This is one of my potteries I, I did. Um, it's a larger oya. Those are the, the favorite shapes I like to make. The, kind of ladies would put on their heads, they have the con con uh, cave bottom, so they can balance, and that was the method you know, to bring the water inside for the homes as a drinking water for the family. And that was a daily chore that the girls and the women would do every day. And the smell of rain, the fresh scent of rain that comes from the pot itself is that essence of water, and all the design on the pots are, you know, uh, prayer for rain and the water spirit in general. So it, uh, you'll see flowers, um, birds, you know, uh, fields, uh, a lot of lines represent rain, and, uh, lightning, thunder. So there's uh, quite a bit of uh, different motifs, but it varies from Pueblo to Pueblo. And I'm going to read a couple of new works. Um, it had been raining here in Santa Fe uh, for two days straight. And so I was sitting in my office and I wrote these, these two little poems. They're like little rain poems. And the first one's called Pass the day drifting on clouds. Pass the day drifting on clouds of greetings and goodbyes, always churning up memories of past promises or regrets. Solemn thoughts soon vanish on distant sunset realms. Every word soaks our dry earth. And then the second day it rained again, so this is another little cloud poem, and it's a companion poem. It's called Slight Hail Mixed with Thunder. Communications of rain, cold, communications of rain, cool, hail mingling with thunder. Drizzle running half bubbles, fashion beads of liquid lather, splashing over stairs of stone as fortuity flows and sizzles. A passing cloud to a sunbeam sparks songs for somber birds. This next poem, when I when I moved up to, to be here at the, as a, the fellow at, at SAR, my grandparents gave me this little hibachi and I've had it for years. I haven't used it since like 1984 and it was all dusty and, and I just washed it off and I built a fire and I cooked out of it and, and it's just still cooking. And I told my son, I'm gonna write a little poem about grandma and grandpa's hibachi. 
And then so I started thinking about words in Laguna that rhyme with abachi. <laughs> and so karawashchi, karawash is a goat, and then uh, washi is bark. And uh, in Japanese, habashi is uh, fire chopsticks. So the title of the poem is called Goat Bark Fire Chopsticks. <laughs> More than 30 years ago, Grandma Linda loaned me her habachi. Got a washi, washi, habashi. Soon Grandpa Philip gave it to me. He said, go ahead and use it. You can have it, his habachi. Got a washi, washi, habashi. Goat bark fire chopsticks. Habashi. 2015, I'm the Landon Resident Fellow, 31 years later at SAR with my Habachi. Garawashi, <laughs> Washi, Habashi. <laughs> Grandma and Grandpa's old Habachi. Little fire bowl still can cook. Never used it until now. My Habachi. Garawashi, Washi, Habashi. Grandma and Grandpa's old Habachi. <laughs> this here is a concrete poem, it's a shape poem, and being a potter, when you go through the different stages of uh, making a, the, working with the clay, at, at any, any time uh, something can go wrong, and you have to start all over again, and it, builds character, it helps you to be patient uh, when, you're, when you're learning to work with the clay. And so I wrote, I wrote this poem in a stair fashion and you read it from the bottom. And so if you all want to read along, I'll, I'll go ahead and read. It's, uh, it's called Stairs of Re Reviving Pottery. And there's two Karis words. Uh, one is showeme, uh, like never mind, let it go. And stranaya uh, mitzi, our mother clay. Stairs of reviving pottery. My last creation nestled in the, in the clay water, slowly dissolving away, my flaw melting. Pool of muddy forgiveness urges me on. By releasing old thoughts, I stir the bowl of preceding notions as water vaporizes. Leaving the gelatinous clay ready to mix, hands sticky, goo slides between fingers, knead and pound, all pockets of air away. I'll start over again, same coveted shape or form, Stranaya Mitzi will decide. Row in hand coils of clay in four circles, revived passion, slicking walls together, now dry and cure, sanding you smooth, burnished body of brush stroke clouds. Go face the fire, ringing the pitch desired, Shroweme masterpiece of endeavor. Okay, this piece might look familiar because it's, it's sitting right here. So <laughs> I um, had done a collaboration with a, a Zuni uh, painter and uh, sculptor, his name's uh, Sylvester Hostito, and he was going through a glitter phase at the time, and <laughs> you, can, you can see that. And, uh, so. It, I had fired a pot, but I'd never painted it. It was a bisque firing, and I, I wasn't too sure what I was going to make out of it, and so I gave it to him, and he made uh, the lightning coming out, and it's actually a collaboration of uh, three artists. Uh, Norvin Johnson did the uh, uh, sterling silver uh, lightning bolts on the side, and then I had some uh, chickens that they looked like eagles, and so I took the chicken feathers off. So it's a collaboration of four. <laughs> but uh, it, there was a poem that came out of it after it was made and looking at it. And so this poem is called Keeper of the Lightning Bolts. Plain clay bottle, hand formed by man, traditionally fired spirit from within. Pottery like cloud with an open lid, select it for your symmetry. Keeper of the lightning bolts, manifest your uni universal mystery. Electrify your thunder cloud vessel through a winding path like river's branches. Crowning top of silver, silvery copper charges, positivity flows through your veins. Storm attracts forces within the pottery cloud. Negativity 
flows through your veins, solid bottle base of purple black charges. Plain bisque bottle cast from potter's hands, lightning passes through you instantly, heating the air, swell of great wave, roar of rumbling deep thunder. Keeper of the lightning bolts, manifest your echo among the stars as flash of light overcomes resistant air. Bring forth currents of electric blue clouds. Shimmering watercraft illuminates summer's night sky. This next poem we're going to read, since it's getting dark outside, it's, it's my ominous poem. And I have to uh, thank my, my editor for uh, uh, really bringing out the poet in me. You know, when I first uh, started writing, I gave her my manuscript, and you know, she asked me if I could write several different forms, which I'd never written before, that they didn't teach at the university, and they were more traditional forms. But I looked at it as like another uh, uh, writing assignment for class, and then took the challenge, and she asked me to write an ominous poem. So this, this poem is called uh, Defenseless to Wintertime Darkness for Andrea. And this is Andrew's pot here that has the rain clouds on there and the ojos and the uh, arrow hits. Down snowdrift icy road, she knocked on faded turquoise door. You need to repaint your door and windows bright blue, grandson. It wards off evil, brings you good luck, a color witches tend to shun. Grandma Mary, nobody believes that anymore. Way too old school. Oh, Manuel. Please draw your curtains at night so witches peeking can't harm you. Guard against the evil eye, hang ojos on your wall. Freezing chill of winter night when insidious witches masquerade, traveling as luminous spheres, they move erratic on gleaming snow. Some ride tides of blizzards in dark solitudes of haunted whirlwinds. Midnight meeting of village witches set to magnetize a black stone, summoning surrounding lightning bolts and strong magnetic forces. Polarize a lodestone, polarize a lodestone, polarize a lodestone. Lodestone knew two hearts of a witch could be controlled by greed, enhancing her strength, enriching her knowledge, easing her switch into an any enchanted shape she desired. Invincible, he would draw her. Which, never neglect nor misplace me, or you will pine away and die. In clay bowl of water, feed me needles and steel specks, my potency. Should someone steal me, menace with madness and wither to bone. Youngest witch was given black stone magnet to aid her debauchery. She lurked in shadows, unbeknownst at dawn, back to her adobe home. On kitchen table, she sat the stone in water, feeding it iron fragments. Nibble while I rest till icicles harden, rouse my nocturnal mayhem. Slush melting, she slept and didn't hear Emmanuel's knock on the door. He stepped into her abode, saw the clay bowl, then snatched the stone. In winter's obsidian blue dusk, she woke up wailing like the winds. Ominous doom ran down her spine, deranging her mind with venom. She'd surveyed who'd stolen her talisman, gazed into water of clay bowl. I'll steal your heart, Manuel, as my sanity drifts and my skin shrivels. You have no safeguards against us. So easy your dwelling is to enter. Peering through your window, I'll shoot cactus needles into your body. As wintry darkness closed in, he could care less to draw his curtains. Soon he heard fast footsteps on the roof, hard scratching at the door. Prowling witch fogged the windows, slipped her silhouette inside. Manuel saw a shadow beside him move and disappear as he turned. Just as the lights flickered out, mass breathing filled his bedroom. Suffocating with senseless malice, savage sounds mirrored his fear.
So I'll go ahead and read a, a more brighter poem. <laughs> so, but, uh, it's a picture of my grandma and grandpa um, taken up in Grants, New Mexico. They just bought a new car. And uh, so they're, my grandma's really happy, and grandpa too. And, so they, and uh, this poem is uh, Sestina. And there's four Karis words in here. Chinna is river. Mame um, is it's, it's really nice. You, you sure know how. Tashkana uh, is the old pottery shards. And Maka is a gourd dipper. Grandma Linda's polishing stone. Before I began to work with Laguna clay, I was told only women can make pottery. Traditional ways heated by my grandmother, yet she gave me one of her polishing stones. She'd sop from a bed of cool chinna water. This entrusted gift soon sparked my fire. A dying tradition urges intent and artistic fire. Curiosity in me revealed the charisma of clay. Determined and self-taught, I built a large water olla to honor the monarchs of Pueblo pottery. Breaking gender taboos didn't turn me to stone. I had an approving smile from my grandmother. Mame, anya me said grandmother. Now find someone to teach you how to fire. You can also use any one of my grinding stones to crush and crumble tashkana and clay. Remember, your spirit is part of the pottery, just as clouds cradle life through rainwater. She said, when it rains, let's collect fresh water. I watched wrinkled hands of my grandmother gather rain from barrels with bowls of pottery. Bring them inside while I warm up by the fire. Now pour some rain in the powdery gray clay. Treasure this mud dough like a precious stone. Not long ago, we used corn cobs and sandstone to smooth wear, later wiped down with water. We burnished only at daytime, slip of white clay. Many customs grow old, like your grandmother. When I'm gone, feed me when you built a fire. Stay diligent and obtain patience with pottery. When she departed, I gave her my first pottery, lustered white with my heirloom river stone. We collected and burned her clothes in the fire, her mukka still hanging where she ladled water. Musing continuum with my dear grandmother, displaying her ways of working with our clay. My grandmother knew I would fall in love with clay. Holding reddish brown stone, I buff my initial fire, ritually smashing pottery. She sends us wondrous water. How are we doing on time? Good? Okay. It's another, another pot that I made a, a few years back. This next poem is called Yellow Rock and the Gingerbread Boy. And it takes place in Philadelphia, New Mexico. And um, my aunts, my mom, and her two sisters, and my grandma, grandpa, and all the cousins, we all would get together for Easter, for Thanksgiving, and we'd all go up to Yellow Rock and scratch our names out. So it, it's all in this poem. It's more like a, a rant, you know, a little kid talking about uh, uh, having a fun time at grandma's house. Yellow Rock and the Gingerbread Boy. Whenever it rained, the grandkids of Philadelphia, New Mexico, would look for arrowheads because wherever lightning strikes, you'll find one. We would go to Yellow Rock and scratch our names out of the yellow sandstone with flint. David, Max, Virginia, Charlene, Cheryl, and Benji. My brother David traced his foot shoe print. On the way back to Grandma Linda's house, we would throw rocks at the pig in the pig pen and sit on top of the big boulders and rub round rocks into the giant grinding stones until we got tired. Grandma's dog, Frisco, show, would show his teeth when you asked him to. Show your teeth, and Frisco would growl up a smile. The old cottonwood tree behind the side Grandma's house was dead. 
Just the trunk remained, standing ten feet tall. It was struck by lightning and died before I was born. But I saw pictures of the old cottonwood tree in black and white photographs when my grandmother was younger. Grandpa would plant corn across the street at the other house. Sometimes we would have to use the outhouse over there when the water pump went out at Siama Well. It was a two-seater and had no roof. Auntie Ruthie got caught in the rain there once. She said it was air conditioned. <laughs> the river was a football field away from the outhouse and when the water pump would go out, I'd go down to the river to take a bath. While I was washing myself in the river, a water snake cruised by, so I scrubbed up in a hurry. When I got back, Grandma called me the gingerbread boy, just like Herman E. Grandma Linda's neighbor, Herman E., went crazy one day and took off all his clothes and knocked on her screen door. She said she saw the gingerbread boy. <laughs> Here's a poem I wrote for Phoenicia. She's here tonight. She's sitting here in the front with Vania. And um, it's called Ode to Phoenicia. And Aragag is Albuquerque. Uh, Guishji is the name of our village in Pawati. It means to hand it down. And Shabap is the uh, uh, symbolic Pueblo emergence into this world. It's called Ode to Phoenicia. Zim and Gur went to Thiru over mesas of Red Rock to see Phoenicia. Little girl carrying green corn, oh, Phoenicia. Luli and Papa Max went to Adagag under sons of Guishji to see Phoenicia. Little girl carrying green corn, oh, Phoenicia. Little corn girl, where did you go? Zim and Gur went back to Shabap under moons of Guishji without ceremony. Little girl carrying green corn, oh, Phoenicia. Lily and Papa Max went back to Shabbat over mesas of sandstone without ceremony. Little girl carrying green corn. Oh, Phoenicia, little corn girl, where did you go? I'd like to uh, finish up with uh, the last three poems that um, were put into the book here. Towards the end, I had a little dog named Cusco, and he uh, got hit by a car. And so um, I wrote three poems all at the same time, and just uh, it was a blessing to have. He was the, just this cute little dog, and I'll read so you know, you'll understand. And so there's, it's a three-part poem. And so the first part is called, uh, it's called Cusco's Garden. Amok Stramas is we all love you, like a group of three or more. And Amo is like uh, an expression of uh, pity or compassion. Amok Stramas, Cusco. You greeted the cloudy blue July morning sky. Even so, little dog clown didn't smile today. Frisbees and tennis balls lay by your igloo. Your perception of Armageddon lingered. Morning Monday, regretful Monday. Luli said, Cusco just got hit by a white truck. Not Cusco, Amok my Cusco. Not Cusco. Papa Max ran downhill to see his dog. Oh, little Cusco, you make everyone laugh. You've only been with us for three years. Miniature Wattweiler. Goodbye, Cusco. Why did they take Cusco away from me? Phoenicia cried and cried. Why Cusco? Why Cusco? You were my special dog. When I was bored, I threw your Frisbee. She held tight to his tennis ball. Always protecting his family, friends, and home. Annie said, you were a laughing medicine dog, so we couldn't grind clay that sad Monday. Tebow tied up after the ordeal. Cusco lay still, dusty ground. They killed our day. They took away our happiness like ripped off roofs. Cyclone, swift forces, throwing trailers, crashing. A grieving moon as night hit the crystal stars. No bark of Cusco heard on Bear Pass Road. Why didn't they slam on the brakes? 
Part two, morning glories at your grave for rest of summer. While in Albuquerque, my neighbors Arnold, Brandon, Charlene, and Benia recalled how you were drifting high above them. Luli, Phanethia, and Papa Max also caught a glimpse of you, small fluffy pup. That Monday afternoon, we could see Cusco in the clouds. In the hot July sun, we buried you in the garden. Phanethia wept as she picked your flowers. Addressed to Cusco, your silver glittered purple hearts. Hello, kitty keychain, a small stuffed animal frog. Holding your chewed open tennis ball all afternoon, she placed some of your black hair inside it. Phanethia sneezed. Cusco's thinking of you. Like a child, we lost our beloved three-year-old. Crying in the rain, we remembered how you always washed your toys in the water trough. You'd bring back your frisbee back to us, all muddy and ready to play. And this is the last part. I saw Cusco sitting on the bench. Two words in Laguna Satya is my dog, and Kaimee, please. Constantly washing your tea balls and frisbees, you never got tired of making us laugh and smile. Phanethia, don't feel so cloudy blue. Cusco wants you to be happy. Satya Cusco, Kaime e Cusco, visit Phanithia. In her dreams, take this ache away from her. Drones of thunder, Cusco, Tibo. Then I heard, hello neighbor, how are you? Cusco spoke through thunder, and when you spoke, the wind blew with the drum beat. Tibo, 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 Tibo. Cusco said hello, silent thunder, then the wind blew with the sound of a dog's bark. Are you cold? Cusco asked. I came back over and the wind blew with laughter of children. Tibo laid down by Cusco's grave. The rain blew with the drumbeat thunder. Inside the house, a cricket chirped with our baby goose. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'll leave the floor open for any questions. I'll come up with ideas uh, usually, and then if, if, uh, if I do, then I'll write it down. But uh, what's uh, nice about working with the clay then when you're painting is your hands will be over here and your mind's over here. So at, at times, you know, you, you, can, you can cheat like that. Yes? Um, what's the effect of using the clay to keep the poses away from you? It's been nice. It's, uh, the school here it has such a vibe of creativity that it kind of feels like I'm not away from home because the place I'm at, it's Santa Fe, it's, it's, uh, it's so peaceful here and, and we're, we're at, we're up on the, the hilltop and uh, I live in an adobe house too so my, uh, my dwelling, it's a split level and so the upstairs feels like I'm going to have to build upstairs at my house you know, when I get back and just, you know, just like here at SAR. <laughs> Uh, there's quite a few actually there's um it's uh changed over the, the gender roles and so there's both female and female um i was talking with the gallery owner in minneapolis and he's doing a a, a tribute to the monarchs of pueblo pottery so he's asking male potters who were taught by their grandmothers or their mothers and uh, now they're a new generation to so i think it's going to be a book and that's going to be a, like a collaboration so i, I um, made a pot for him and it had uh, four hummingbirds on it. And I remember the four ladies that helped me become a potter, my, my grandmother, um, 
uh, a, a lady in, in Laguna, her name's uh, Gladys Paquin. She taught me how to do the outdoor firing. And then um, my uh, mother-in-law, uh, Mary Martin from Cochiti, uh, we'd get different kinds of paints. And then um, the grandmother up there in Cochiti, uh, she was an established potter and uh, get little, um, you know, um, tidbits of information from her and, and, and good advice on how to mix the clay just right. So uh, it, it takes a lot of uh, information to, to just to build the pot in uh, a good month or two. Um, yeah. Yes, well, when, when I started writing, um, you know, looking at some of the other um, Native American writers like um, Scott Mamaday and Joe Harjo, uh, Lucy Tapahanso, you know, um, when I started taking classes, they were teaching at UNM, so I, you know, I got to take her class, and, but then Joe Harjo had left and Lucy Tapahanso had left, so I never really got to uh, have them as my mentors. But uh, looking at the way I, I, I write from within the community, um, I try to get a balance of uh, coming up in my own uh, form, you know, so it's, uh, they're private poems, but you end up making them public, but at the same time you create your own style, that's been, you know, what, you know, what I call it, and uh, it's, uh, it's been a wonderful blessing to be able to write, because I, I didn't know I could write before, um, I just went back to school for my um, pre-law degree, and took my first poetry class, and was getting an A for the day, and, from then, I just started writing and switched over to creative writing. Yes, Pat. Tell them about the previous pot you helped design. Oh, yeah. Uh, there was a, a sculptor that came to the Southside Library here in Santa Fe, and he had done, uh, it's out of rebar, and it's this huge pot, I mean, it like hangs over the library. And he asked me to come over, and the mayor of Santa Fe was there that day, and the, the librarian and staff, and um, they hung this big olea above the library, and he used different kinds of fiber throughout the, uh, the, the olea, and uh, it's, it still it stands there. How many years has it been now? It's been probably about like, like five years. And uh, Randy Walker, he was the, uh, the designer of the piece, and um, I wrote a poem about, about that too. Could, uh, could read it. If there's any, any more questions. Thank you. Hmm? Thank you.